There's so much suspense. Oh, goodness. You all were supposed to like spontaneously break out in a song or do something while you were just chilling. How are you? I'm good. good. I'm good. Good. You're Drying out like too. you too. This yeah, elevation has got me game. got Sorry, me going game. here. Ah, thank you so much, Eve. Thank it you. It was so wonderful. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah, yeah. Just just uh, always better to hear the poetry spoken aloud and thank by you. an author. So it's really beautiful. Thank you. I've got no cards. I'm going, I see I'm, that. I'm old, You're I'm very old, ready. I'm, I'm old tech. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm into it. Um, okay, so uh, I want to talk about a lot of stuff. Okay, but me too. Uh, And it's not going to be focused purely around 1919. Great, I hope that's love okay. it. Um, and, you know, uh, a place I want to start is because we're both teachers. Yes. And I feel like, um, I feel like you learn a lot about somebody uh, when you hear about their sort of journey to becoming a teacher and why they do it. Yeah. And so I want to ask you about that. Like, how, like, how did you come to teaching and, and what, you know, like, how did you get there? And what, what, what did that do for you? Yeah. So. Thank you for that question. Um, so I, I became a teacher. I started when I was in college, I always loved kids, always worked with kids. If there are any other nineties people in the audience, the babysitters club was like wildly influential. <laughs> Uh, the novelist Walter Mosley talks about how most authors, George R. R. Martin says this too, like most authors lie about who their earliest influences are. They're like, my grand, you know, I read Tolstoy as a third grader. And it's like, no, you didn't. You read The Hardy Boys, you read Nancy Drew, you read comic books, and you read The Babysitter's Club. So um, it sounds kind of silly, but for me, that was kind of an early model of like the idea that caring for children is a respectable form of labor and an important form of labor. And so um, when I became, when I was uh, uh, in college, I started working at a program run by my university where I was uh, like a classroom aide. And so I worked in a first grade classroom and I worked in, then I worked in a second grade classroom. I also briefly worked at Sue Duncan's Children's Center, which Sue Duncan is the mother of Arnie Duncan. Uh -huh. um, and she runs this, uh, she runs this like really small boutique, um, uh, she used to run this really small boutique like after school program. It was just her in a room with like 30 kids. It was the most amazing thing I ever, Arnie Duncan would actually never have approved of this actually. Sure. Um, but it was a really weird and cool after school program. Michael Clark Duncan was an alum of this program, also not related to the other Duncans. Anyway, so I started working in classrooms and with kids when I was in college. And um, I became aware at a really young age uh, of how educational disparities operated even within my same city. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when I was in middle school, I played basketball. My basketball career ended at, in the eighth grade. Um, but it, there's always next year, right? I could make <laughs> my comeback any time now. Um, but as a basketball player, I remember seeing other schools in different parts of the city, right? And like going to use a bathroom in a school and there's no door, mm -hmm. right, on the, on the bathroom stall or the bathrooms aren't clean. Um, I saw the differences in the way that I was treated versus the way my brother as a black boy was treated, the way that race intersected with gender. Um, this is like the 90s, right? This is like the height of like zero tolerance, punishment, school exclusion, and things like that. Um, I attended, Chicago has a very competitive, high stakes, testing based um, high school system, yeah. similarly to places like Boston and New York. And so I went to a different high school than my brother. And in my high school, we had, these are both public schools. Mm -hmm. My high school, we had an Olympic-sized swimming pool. We had seven languages. I took French and Japanese in high school. Um, we had uh, anything that I could, you know, I didn't have to ask to go to the bathroom. I could, like, get up and walk out if I wanted to because my teachers respected me. And my brother's high school was, like, the lean-on-me high school. It was, like, Joe Clark was, like, like, they had chains on the doors, right? He was very afraid to go to school every day. And so I became very aware of this as a young person. And then when I started working in classrooms, uh, I became even more aware of this, right? And I saw kids coming to school, uh, little kids, right? I started in first grade, second grade. I saw kids coming to school with things going on in their lives that I understood were impeding their learning that had absolutely nothing to do with mm -hmm. them, right? Mm -hmm. Not their fault. Six-year-olds, like nothing is their fault. They're six. And so um, I became really interested in that. And nevertheless, nobody ever encouraged me to be a teacher. Like even though I was great with kids and I was smart and like, you know, I, my, my mom didn't go to college. And the idea that you would kind of overcome the odds and go to, go to an elite university and then become a teacher was like anathema, right? right? This was right. not, and, and so I also got the message very early on about the ways that people don't respect the labor of teachers. They don't, they don't see teaching as an intellectual profession. They see teaching as you know, part of a suite of historically feminized caregiving professions, and that's why it so, continues to be so low status in our society. So I remember um, 
my fourth year of college, I was like, I'm going to join the Peace Corps. I love, I want to go, I love French. I'm going to go abroad. I'm going to go to a West African country, and I'm going to be a teacher, and I'll get to work with kids, and I'll speak French, and it'll just be great, whatever. And so I went through the whole Peace Corps admissions process, and I was like, I think I was up to the part where they had to get my dental records. So I was pretty far along. And I, <laughs> I took a leave, which is once people start asking for your dental records, you know, in retrospect, you're like, huh, maybe this is not a good idea. Um, but I took a leave of absence from school. I, took th I, I quit school for three months, and I went and lived in Paris by myself. Mm -hmm. And once I was out of the country for about two weeks, I was like, I'm not in a place in my life where I want to live in another country for two years. Had a lot of tumultuous family stuff happening, and I found myself crying. And a good mentor of mine always says, when you're crying, ask yourself why you're crying. Mm -hmm. And I realized that what I was looking forward to was not living abroad or you know, having this adventure or speaking French or like living in West Africa. What I realized that when I imagined my future, what I had been imagining was my future as a teacher. Mm -hmm. And I had, if, if there's any like Clueless fans in the audience, the moment where Cher realizes that she's in love with Paul Rudd, <laughs> she's like, oh my God, I love Josh, right? That was me, I had to like come to this deductive reasoning of like, oh, I want to, I'm feeling this way because I actually want to be a teacher. This is a thing that I want. And in fact, there are people in my community that need teachers. I don't need to go to another place to be yeah. a teacher. I can be a teacher at home. But I think about that all the time, about how like, even though I was very clearly showing the signs of having an aptitude and an interest in something, no one ever said, you should become a teacher. And I think that that um, really did me a disservice and did the profession a disservice. And I remember when I told my parents uh, that I was going to be doing it, I feel like they were like devastated. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and I remember my father, I remember his voice on the phone. He was like, well, I never thought you'd be doing that. And the that the like the italics on the phone were like so high. like that was like <laughs> leaned up. it's like a thirty degree angle, and his mother was a teacher. My grandmother was a teacher for forty years, yeah. right? Like, and you know, and my father is an artist. It's not like he's like a high step, you know, like. Yeah. And so, but but these are the myths that we have internalized mm -hmm. that this is not intellectual work, that this is not high status work, that this is too difficult, right? And um, both my parents, you know, later on were very repentant and very sorry and were extremely supportive of me as, as a teacher. But I think they just, I don't know what they thought. I think they just thought I'd be like sitting in the middle of a group of kids just like throwing rocks at me. <laughs> I don't know what they thought. But I, I, I think that one of the most interesting things as a teacher is the way people respond to you when you tell them you're, that, they're, that you're a teacher and like the things that they say. Yeah. Those are some of probably my earliest sociological observations because it says more about them than it says about you or the profession. Absolutely. The thinly veiled like horror, especially I was a middle school teacher. You right. tell people you teach middle school, they're like, <laughs> their life flashes before their eyes. They're like, oh, you know. And then the other thing about being a teacher is that everyone has an opinion about your job with yep. zero expertise, right? Zero. So like, you know, I went to the allergy doctor and the allergy doc and I'm at this point I was getting my doctorate in education. Like I'm at Harvard University getting a doctorate in I have two master's degrees. Mm -hmm. I've been a teacher. And my allergy doctor is like, education, eh? You know what they need to do? And I'm like, here it comes. <laughs> and I bet you know what it's gonna be. He's like, they need to give all the kids iPads. <laughs> every give every kid an iPad and then he was like we need to have buses he had this theory that buses should like drive around the black neighborhoods of Boston and pick kids up and then like right busing in Boston what a unique yeah, idea right. <laughs> and it should take them to do internships and I'm like I just have really bad allergies and I just need you <laughs> I just am I am only here because I want your opinion on that one thing yeah. right that one thing my husband is an economist and as an economist, I watch people frequently defer to him on things he knows nothing about. Yeah. Absolutely nothing. He doesn't know what's going to happen. He, he studies like taxes and so he doesn't know what's going to happen to the Dow Jones tomorrow. And in our field, people who know absolutely nothing, they are here to tell you because they went to school. Yes. So they know. They're experts. They're, they're experts. At least 12 years, 12 right? Years. Yeah, they yeah, did yeah. 12 good years. Yeah. 12 good years. And I'm always like, if I had a dollar for every time somebody told me, give all the kids iPads, I will be able to purchase iPads for every kid, <laughs> for every kid in America. No, it just happened to me today. So, oh, really? So was it the, the iPads? Not the iPads. It was. Uh, um, iPads uh, aren't that great. Uh, because the the NAEP scores came out, and mm -hmm. someone was saying, "Oh, the scores in New Mexico are so low. We need to be doing what Mississippi and Alabama are doing because they showed what? raises." And I was like, "Ah, oh, you have no idea what." The Sentences no one has yeah, ever yes, said. Yes. No education <laughs> scholar has ever said. <laughs> yes, yes. We need to be doing. <laughs> What Mississippi and Alabama I do. Right, right. <laughs> That's a bummer, man. That's a bummer.
Um, anyway. Do, uh, uh, we'll move on from the teaching in a minute, but I'm curious. Uh, like, do you, Let's never move on. I have so you, many complaints. Do you, do, you miss, so do you miss the kids? Do you miss all, it? All the time. Yeah, Love teaching. I, you know, I feel that every teacher kind of has their zone. Yeah. Right. So like middle school is my jam. Right. Ah. Like and every right, and like every teacher, like if you go to a kindergarten teacher, the older the people who teach the big kids like kindergartens are gross. They pee on themselves. Right. right? <laughs> they like sneeze. I once had a first grader sneeze directly <laughs> into my mouth. Right? <laughs> like directly. I was like, well, and then if you, you know, the numerator and they're like, like, they like <laughs> so, you know, like little kids are gross. But then the people who teach the little kids, they're like older kids. They just are making out all that. They curse yeah, at yeah. you. Middle school is perfect to me because middle school students always tell you exactly how they're feeling. Yeah. They have no, they're not trying to be cool. They're not trying to conceal their emotions. If they are mad, they come in, they're like, I'm so mad. If they are sad, they come in, they're like, this is the worst day of my life. They're crying, right? If they're happy, they're jumping in the air. That is like, that is so me. Yeah. I'm so into that. And so I really, I really love it. And what I really miss about it is that usually in middle school, the worst thing that a kid, can, on most days of my job, the worst thing that a kid could do was also usually quite funny. Like often, like also the funniest thing that they could do. Like the things that they would come up with to do were just so comical, yeah. you know, um, that I just, I really, yeah, I miss, I miss kids. I love, I love teaching. And I would, I think that one of the biggest differences, whenever people, when I, I left CPS, I left teaching at a Chicago public school, and I went to Harvard, right? And so people were like, oh, it's so hard. I'm like, have you ever had a job where you couldn't go to the bathroom all day? <laughs> like, have you ever had a job where you, like, I used to work a 14-hour day as a yep. teacher, every yep. day. And if you, every single thing I need, you know, when we, as professors, we have people, if the copy machine breaks, someone comes fix it, fixes it, yep. right? If, the, if there's, like, administrative things to do. As a teacher, you are the president, CEO, chief technology officer, yeah. chief finance, you are running a whole situation. It's you and these like 30 people that's in your fiefdom, right, in this room. And that's really, really hard. And it's also the most intellectually rigorous work I've ever done in my life. Mm -hmm. Because if you've ever tried to teach one person one thing, right, think about a time you try to teach one person how to tie their shoe or how to fix, you know, my husband trying to teach me how to make, use the Sonos app on my phone, mm -hmm. which I refuse mm -hmm. to do, right? Like, multiply that by, all, I, you know, when I started out teaching, I had 170 kids, Yep. right? Every one of them is a different, magical, special human being. And you have to figure out how to get each of these special, magical, miraculous brains to understand, like, the layers of the earth. Yep, yep. <laughs> Which none of us have ever seen. And if any of us actually saw it, we would die instantly. <laughs> right? <laughs> How do you do that? That's amazing. That's way harder than anything I do right now. And the number one thing that makes it not sustainable is not for, if you love that work, is not the kids. It's mostly the adults. And it's also the absurd expectations of the job, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. I would still be a middle school teacher, most likely, if I could, like, go to the bathroom, ha you know, like, have people to assist me with the administrative work. Um, put in, have the attention and the time and the personnel to put in the work that kids deserve and yes. the attention that yes. kids deserve, yes. right? All of those things. And yes. Yes. that has nothing to do with kids, right? That has nothing to do with kids being hard or yes. whatever. Yes. Adults, are, adults are garbage. <laughs> Met an adult recently? That's, adults suck, right? Uh, middle school, and the other thing, and then I'll stop talking about like my, ten, ten, my BuzzFeed list of like 10 things I love about middle school. The other thing about middle school that's so awesome is that middle school students are um, sophisticated enough cognitively that you can have like really abstract yeah. conversations with them. Like you can have ethical, you can read, you know, we would read like To Kill a Mockingbird or Romeo. You can have like a deep conversation with a 13 year old, but also so many of the things you're talking about, they are encountering for the first time in their entire yes. life. Yes. So it's like the first time in their life that they're asking this question of like, oh, who am I? What do yeah. I believe? To see somebody, like to be with somebody in that phase of their life, oh, that's so cool. Times like 100, yep. that's so cool. That's awesome. I totally miss that. Yeah, I, I, uh, I was a high school teacher, and I love teaching high school, and I still totally miss it. Um, uh, but I get that high school students are a little more hardened by the time. Yeah. And, and, and those middle school students were always, they're in this in-between spot. They're, they're figuring they're so out their pure. bodies and their, what they're thinking and there's yeah. all this stuff. And there's, there's something so beautiful about that moment yeah, as well. Yeah, they're pure. They're um, pure essence of humans. Yes, yes, yeah. It was really wonderful. All right. Well, let's, uh, well, let, let's get on to the other work. Um, so, so you and I, I, I uh, one of the things I know folks find, you're going to kill me for, for asking this question. Oh, but, uh oh um, that's such uh, a good preamble. Thank every, you. Everyone, everyone. 
Okay, I'm trying to think where to start. One of the things that folks find, I think, so fascinating about your work is, is the genre stuff. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, when I was prepping for this, I was like, okay, I'm gonna ask, I wanna ask Eve a question about genre. And so I emailed Eve and I gave her a list of some things I was thinking about, and she, her reply was like, okay, but don't ask me about genre, because people always ask me about that, and they always ask these questions like, how do you write between different genres? Do you just push a button and do you do that? Yeah, like, I'm like and, I don't know. And, and I said, I said, oh, all right. So I was like, <laughs> I believe I really want to ask you questions about genre, but I'm going to ask, I hopefully can ask you some smarter questions okay. than the ones that you've been asked before. No shade to all the people who've asked yes, me that Yes, yeah, no shade to all the people who've asked that. Um, but I get it because, you know, I, I, I view you as an artist, and I know Thank artists, you. and artists just, they say what they got to say and make sense of the world yeah. in whatever form they do, yeah. right? And so I think the point is not to ask you a question about how do you switch between Marvel and, and you know, Ghost in the Schoolyard right. and, and then, you know, or like a manuscript for Yeah, yeah, that's not, that, that's not it. But what I want, there's a couple things I want to know and I'm really curious about. Okay. So for instance, for you as, as, a, as a writer and artist and a thinker, what does, what, like what do different genres do for you in terms mm. of your expression? That's a good question. Yeah, and I appreciate, you know, the difficulty, <laughs> nailed it. You know, when people ask me, like, how do you, I'm like, I, I don't know, how do you eat? Sometimes you eat, you have a bowl in your house, sometimes you put ice cream in it, sometimes you put cereal yeah. in it. How do you use this bowl for all these different things? Like, I don't know, man, this is sometimes, <laughs> you, you want different types of foods. You know, so I, I, I used to, when I first started out, I used to try to answer the genre question, and I just realized my answers were terrible, because the answer, the real answer is I don't know. Yeah. Um, but your question is good. Um, and the other question is not that it's bad, it's just that I don't know the answer, right? Yeah. I just like make you're things. Just, you're and then, just expressing and yeah, then it comes out of like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I think that I, I've now come to see my work in kind of like two simultaneously operating strands. This could change tomorrow, but this yeah. is the way I'm making sense of this right now. Um, <clears throat> is that I think one strand of my work is trying to cast a critical lens on the existing world. Yes. So I'm trying to ask the questions, how did the world as we understand it get to be how it is? Yeah. Um, how can we resist uh, our tendency to take for granted that the present necessarily had to be this present? Yes. Right. So, like Emmett Till didn't have to die. It didn't have to. He, he should. There's no. He didn't have to die. Right. right? And schools didn't have to be closed. Right. And uh, when I give my Ghost in the Schoolyard talk, what I usually end. It's like super depressing. It's just as depressing as this talk. It has depressing pictures. I'm just a downer. Nobody invites me to things to be like uplifting and positive. Uh, <laughs> But what I end, by, I end that talk by saying, my one piece of good news is that people made this history, mm -hmm. and so people can unmake it, right? I often talk about, yeah, you yes. clap for that, that's great. And you're like, oh, yes, a happy that. thing. Yes, I clap for the one marginally non-depressing thing. Um, and I, I often joke about like the segregation fairy, yeah. right? Like people think that a segregation fairy went around at night and waved her wand of Jim Crow and then like America became segregated. That didn't happen. Humans did this, yeah. right? These are all artifices of human, edifices and artifices of human culture. And I think it's really important for us to, to understand that because it then allows us this, for me, what is the second part of my work, second strand of my work, which is imagining how the world could be otherwise, yeah. right? How can things be otherwise? And I think that um, that to me is where things like poetry and comic books are really important because as I said, it doesn't, it doesn't cost me anything to make that world, right? It doesn't cost me anything to you know, write a poem in which like aliens land on earth and they're black and they're like coming to free everyone. Like yeah. that doesn't cost me anything, right? right? It doesn't cost me anything um, to write a poem in which Emmett Till is alive. Um, it doesn't cost me anything to write. There's a short story in 1919. There's one little short story in it that's not a poem. Um, and it's about uh, children unmaking borders. Yeah. Like children, children get together one day and they collect, it's like a sci-fi story where children collectively erase borders. Um, that doesn't cost me anything. And so I think that that's kind of what these different genres are doing for me at this stage is allowing for, uh, on the one hand, critical interrogation, on the other hand, imaginative work. And I, I often, I use the word prototype a lot. I see myself as building, mm. like, I see these works as like uh, scale models or maquettes. Um, it's, a, it's a snow globe. It's like the architectural rendering of what the world could be, yeah. right? I really like architectural renderings because I like to look at the little um, people that are populating yeah. the yeah, place yeah, yeah. <laughs> and like think about what they're doing, <laughs> you know? Um, and I, I love that kind of imaginative space, spaces of possibility. So that's, that's kind of what different genres are doing for me. I also, um, 
My first book, Electric Arches, right now I'm working on adapting it uh, for television. Um, yeah, it's weird. Yeah. People are like, it's a poetry book on TV? How's that gonna work? Um, and so I'm writing this pilot right now, and the, the pilot is based on the first poem in the book, uh, Arrival Day. And, um, you know, I really think, I'm starting to think also about TV and film and comic books. Like, writing, writing comic books has started me to think more about mass media. Yeah. Right? And, like, what you accomplish uh, in, these, in these other media, especially media that are considered kind of low culture or disreputable yeah. uh, by mainstream society. Um, Martin Scorsese wrote this like really controversial op-ed that some of you may have seen where he expands on his opinion that none of the Marvel Cinematic Universe is yeah, art, yeah, yeah. none of it is cinema. Um, and that's fine, like he's entitled to his opinion. But what really depressed me about that was I did what you're never supposed to do and I read the comments. And in the comments, so many people were using comic books and video games, as, which are both two art forms that are really important to me, and they were using them as shorthands to mean like non-art, yeah. right? And I think about hip hop, jazz, and comic books are three art forms that were invented in the United States. They're three art forms that were invented by socially marginalized people and popularized and beloved by young people, right? That have now, like jazz has now moved into being like considered a more respectable thing. Hip hop is like eh, on the edge. Comics is like eh, also on the edge. And, um, but I, I'm just increasingly thinking about how those kinds of media that reach lots and lots of people can begin to, um, can begin to create spaces for really interesting dialogue. And I think about how many people in our society started thinking about inequality and prejudice uh, from watching Star Trek. Right. Right? Yeah. <laughs> right? How many people start thinking about inequality and prejudice from reading the X-Men? Yeah. Right? And um, so I've been, just been thinking about that a lot recently. Um, yeah. No, thank you. That, that's wonderful. I mean, I had to ask the question. I'm an old hip-hop no, head myself. It. Yeah, and yeah. Mixing and remixing, and I was like, okay, I love genre bending, and I love reaching for that space. Yeah. So just to stay in that vein a little bit, not about genre, but, but moving to the sort of pop culture, mm -hmm. mass culture. Yes quote unquote low culture, yeah, right? Which it. is all stuff I love and, yeah. and um, I just want to ask you about Marvel, right? Because here's, yeah. here's, I mean, here's this thing, right? It's, it's like, like, um, it's it's like, like amazing, mind blowing, right? Yeah. Um, and so I, the question, I had a bunch of questions, but just time wise, I'll ask you just a couple. Um, I just want to ask you like what, to me, like I see it as a form of cultural work. Yes, and I so love I what you said in the introduction made me feel so seen. And I, and I honestly and I, thank I, you for that. Thank you, thank you, I appreciate that. And, but I want to ask you, like, what, what kind of cultural work do you see yourself yes. doing through the Marvel comic? Thank you yeah. for that question. The one sentence version is I write propaganda to poison the minds of America's youth. Yes. Uh, <laughs> and to bend them towards my <clears throat> political ideologies and agenda. Uh, that's, well, so, okay, so, um, so Marvel Comics, uh, Marvel is 80 years old, mm -hmm. right? Last year I wrote a series for Marvel called Marvel Team Up, um, in which uh, Peter Parker, who's the original OG Spider-Man, right, and Kamala Khan, who is a 16-year-old Pakistani-American mm -hmm. Muslim girl mm -hmm. from Jersey City, New Jersey, right? She's the first Muslim character to headline a, a, major, a major publishing house comic book. Um, I was asked by Marvel to write a story about Peter and Kamala, and to, they have to like team up and have an adventure. It has to be three issues, right? So it has to like begin and end in three issues. And I was like, okay, they're gonna switch bodies. Nice. Right? And so Peter is gonna have to be a 16-year-old Muslim Pakistani-American <laughs> girl living in New Jersey, right? And, um, you know, I think about like, but when I was writing, the whole time I was writing Spider-Man, the whole time I was writing that story, Spider-Man is like, it's Spider-Man. Like, you can go anywhere in the world and people know who Spider-Man is. Yeah. So the whole time I was writing this story, I was walking around my house for like a week and I would look in the mirror and I'd be like, I write the words that Spider-Man says. Yeah. Like, I just, like, I couldn't get all, I was so, I would stop my husband and be like, I write words and Peter Parker says them. And he's like, yes, you do, good job, you know? Um, but that is like, it, it, you know, you and I both believe in our scholarship. When we're critical race theorists, right? Like we bring our bodies and ourselves and our yes, histories into into what we do and what we create. And so I am I am um, in Marvel's 80 year history. I am Black woman number five to mm -hmm. write. Um, and wow. I think that I write things differently. And so when when it was first rumored that I was going to get hired by Marvel, it was just a rumor at this stage. It was like actually before Marvel had even called me. This was like a rumor even to me. Uh, <laughs> 
I was like, that's never gonna, that's like NASA's gonna call me tomorrow and I'm gonna be like, you wanna come to space? I'll be like, hell yeah, I wanna go to space, let's go. <laughs> Just kidding, I would never go to space. <laughs> Very afraid of going to space. Um, but Marvel, when it was just rumored that they were gonna hire me, uh, the level of vitriolic, racist and misogynist mm -hmm. harassment that I received on the internet um, far surpassed anything that I've ever received for anything I've ever done, right? And if you don't follow me on Twitter, like I get on the internet every day and I'm like, end all prisons. America is like a fascist, genocidal, yeah. Yeah. like I get on Twitter and I say all these things. All this stuff is fine, right? Uh, let me be rumored to be writing a pretend story about a girl who flies around in a metal suit and shoots pulsar beams from her hand, right? That was enraging. It was enraging. It was enraging to these people. They, made, they, make, they still make YouTube videos. I mean, don't look up any. They're horrible. Somebody sent me a picture of a burning cross, yep. right? Like, the level of stuff was bonkers. And... Um, one of the first people who reached out to me and was really supportive was ta Coates, mm -hmm. who writes Black Panther and is now writing, uh, yeah, clap for ta he's awesome. <laughs> he's great. He's an Oprah's book club, he's like, he don't need your clapping, but that's what he's, <laughs> he appreciates it, you know, he's, he's doing good, You're doing real good. Um, so ta contacted me and he was like, you know, if you want to do this, you should do it, but you, you also need to be prepared that this is going to be the most racism and sexism you've ever encountered in your life. And it will also be the most fun and coolest thing you can ever do. And, you know, I, t I said to him, I was like, I'm really confused by how upset this makes people. Really, and, you know, I'm a sociologist and I study racism. So when people say racist things to me, I'm like, Huh, fascinating. You know, I'm like, <laughs> fascinating, right? Like, I'm like, it's a good technique to survive yeah. the abuse. No, it is. It is. Some it is. of it is yeah. totally coping mechanism, right? Yeah. Like, 1% of the time I get really hurt, and 99% of the time I'm like, fascinating subject. You know, I'm like, really interested. So I said, I was like, I'm really confused that this is the thing. Like, this is the thing that makes them so mad. Right? When I said, if you buy free range eggs, you should probably be a prison abolitionist, that, that wasn't as, <laughs> like, that wasn't the thing, right? Um, and he said, Thank you to the people who just got that yeah. joke 45 <laughs> seconds later. Uh, but he said, no, they're right. They're correct. Because what they understand is that, and what I have come to understand, is that um, comic books are, in all their low culture glory, right? I, I, write some, I write a serial story that people pay $4 for a really floppy, crappy piece of paper Right, and it's serialized. In a world that is all like binging everything, comic books is a world where like, you have to go to a store yeah. and you have to wait a month to find out what's gonna happen. You have to go to a store, talk to a human, and buy a thing. Like that's really, you know. But in all of that glory, um, comic books are our cultural mythology. This is our shared cultural mythology. When I was a kid growing up in Chicago, and I would walk around at night if I was coming home late in the dark, if I was afraid, I would look up at buildings and I would think, maybe Batman was just there. Right. Like he was just there a second, I just missed him. You know, if, maybe if I look, I could just catch the tail end of his cape swooshing around the cornice of this building, right? It matters if children who are scared or people who are trying to look for stories about what it means to be brave or courageous see Riri Williams, Yeah. right? Yeah. 15 year old, black girl who's lost multiple people that she loves to gun violence, who suffers from PTSD, who lives with her mom, who loves her very, very much, who is like really awkward and kind of is bad at social interactions. It matters that Riri is the hero yeah. in these stories. It does. And it's threatening to the maintenance of white supremacy for Riri to be the hero. It's threatening for little white kids to tell their parents they want to be T'Challa, the Black Panther, for yep. Halloween. Yep. That is threatening, right? It's, it's threatening for little girls of all races to dress up as Ms. Marvel, yep. right? And to wear her costume, which is based on like Pakistani traditional clothes, right? That's like upending what America wants to think about itself. Yes. And that is, that is really powerful. And so I have come to um, I have come to see that work. And I've also, 
think of this also as a space of, I can't tell, like I'm doing a new project for Marvel that'll be announced in the next month or so. Um, but it's like really sociological, so I'm interested, when's, when's public, uh, or I'll tell you about it later and everyone else, sorry, you just have to wait. Um, <laughs> but I also think of this as a space, so like I'll give you one example, and I'm sorry I'm very long-winded, but like, um, there's a scene in Ironheart, so for those of you who don't know, this character I write, her name is Riri, she's a black girl, we've talked about all that, and she wears this metal suit, so, and it's inspired by Tony Stark's Iron Man, uh, he was her mentor, and so she wears this like bulletproof metal suit. And there's this scene in Ironheart 5 where she's just like, we've just come to the end of the story, she beat the bad guy that she's been trying to beat for like five issues, everything's great, and there was a gunfight going off, and so the police burst into this place where she was. Mm -hmm. And the first thing she does is put her hands up, right? She can't actually be shot. Right. But in her head, everything that's in her, everything that she's seen in her life, right, her first instinct is she doesn't, in that moment, she's not Ironheart, she's Riri, right? And she sees the police and puts her hands up. Yeah. And so those are the kinds of moments that, you know, I wrote a, I wrote a, a three-page story about um, X-23, who's Wolverine's clone. Yep. So she's like a, a girl Wolverine. She has these claws. She's really cool. And I wrote a scene of her uh, like breaking out a group of migrant children that were in incarcerated. And she's, she's raised in a lab. Yeah. Um, thank you. So she herself was raised in a lab. And so she, she finds these kids and she's like, no kid deserves to be in the cage, right? right? Like, and this is all in the legacy of Stan Lee. This is what yep. Marvel has yep. always done. And so, um, so yeah, I feel really grateful. Um, and the funny thing is that like most of the white supremacist people that hate me so much and that were so mad that I got hired, they don't actually read any of my comics because then they'd be really mad. Like, I'm like, I have stormed. I wrote a page where like storm saves like a girl who's migrating from Mali to Italy on a boat and her entire family is like, her, their boats have, like I'm just putting all this political stuff in yeah. and they don't actually read it so they don't know. So <laughs> don't tell them. Um, but yeah, I, I do, I, I see it very much as, as culture work and yeah. as a, a place to broach conversations um, that is wildly accessible and also like fun. I just want people to have a good time reading the stories too. So that's so awesome. Well, thank, thank you, you for that. I, I, thank it's, you. It's, Thanks it's for been reading. So it. lovely. Um, so before we go, uh, one last thing mm -hmm. before we run out of time here. Um, I'd, I'd be remiss if we didn't get a chance to touch on Chicago. Yes. Right? Because you know you are Chicago. Oh, thank and, you. And I see your work, like you know, as as I read the, this body of work, and I was thinking, like, boy, you know, he really is. I mean. I couldn't, quite, I couldn't quite decide, but I was like, Eva's, she's partly at least writing like a love letter to Chicago, yeah. right? And also trying to tell the world about Chicago. Mm -hmm. and, and quick shout out to uh, the Chicago Teachers Union and yes. the most recent struggles. And, and the, and mighty, the, and mighty CTU. Yeah, 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 the mighty, mighty CTU. Um, I, am a, I, am, I am not a, I am a former member of the Chicago Teachers Union, and I also, I do maintain an active, uh, even though I'm a professor, I maintain an active Illinois State Board of Education licensure. Yeah, right on. Uh, which I did after I was volunteering in a classroom, and a kid started bleeding, and the teacher was like, you're a teacher, just cover the class, and then took the kid out, and I was like, I'm not legally a teacher. <laughs> so then I went and re-upped my licensure so that in an emergency, you can leave me alone. Le I can, so, le uh, can legally be left alone with the room. Yeah, I lost my, I gave up my credentials yeah. a long time ago. I um, sent them all my graduate school transcripts. I was like, just take, this counts. Um, so, so, but you know, I mean, in Chicago is so critical, right? Because especially around education, it's this, yeah. there's this like, racialized, capitalist, neoliberal ed reform movement that's really sort of, you know, it's, it's like, it's like, it's almost it's like a boring. lab, yeah, you know, it's, it's like there, there, right? Yeah. And then here we have like the CTU and such incredible organizing and, and, and community organizing beyond the CTU just to fight back and hunger strikes a diet. I mean, yeah. all, all these, all these things. And so, um, you know, I guess I'm, I'm trying to, I'm struggling for what question I want to ask. I just love to get your, like, like what, like what do you want to say? Like what are you trying to say to the world about Chicago? Yeah. Right. Or, yeah. or what, what are you trying to say in your love letter to Chicago? I'm just, I'm, I just want to yeah, know how you are. You it's so that. rooted for you, you know. So. You know, there are two things. On the one hand, I do think Chicago is the greatest city in the known multiverse. I think that is <laughs> scientific fact. All Chicagoans will tell you this. Therefore, it must be true. It must be true. Um, so I do think that there are things about the city that are really special. I think our organizing history is special. I think our literary history is special. I see myself in the, trying to work you know, with humility in the tradition of Carl Sandburg, of Sandra Cisneros, of Gwendolyn Brooks, of Studs Terkel, of Stuart yes. Dybeck, yes. right? Um, As you should. I, you know, I think our food is really good. Uh, you know, all those things. And so I do think that there are things about the city that are really special. That being said, when I talk about Chicago, much of what I'm actually trying to model is 
uh, what it looks like to ask really hard questions about the place where you're from and to love it really hard. Yes. Um, and that place can be, for me, it is Chicago, right? But that place can be, can be anywhere. And, you know, like Ghosts in the Schoolyard, my second book, is, a, is about this racist policy and how it came from this racist history. But, you know, any history anywhere in the United States, wherever you live, if you start digging and asking questions, there's some dirt, yeah. right? And that's true in the US, that's true in Canada, that's true in Australia, that's true in all of these countries that were built upon foundations of inequality. Yeah. America as we understand it in the 21st century does not exist without the genocide of indigenous peoples and chattel slavery yeah. of, of, of African people, of kidnapped African people, period. And so anywhere you live, you can ask these questions. And conversely, anywhere you live, you can band together with people you really care about and fight for things that are really important to you. Yeah. And I think that that is you know, so much of what we do, like when Electric Arches came out, it was right when like Chance the Rapper was super hot and everybody was asking me in every interview, like what is it about Chicago? And I felt like they wanted me to say like, you know, they sprinkle something in the water that like makes great art or something. And really what it is, like the thing that makes, like the thing that makes Chicago art really good is that Chicago artists don't compete with each other, mm -hmm. right? We see our friends and we're like, our friend is doing a good thing, right? Which is different than New York or LA or some other kind of cultural ecosystems. And that's a, that's a free thing. That's a thing anybody can copy. Mm -hmm. Wherever you live, you can find out who the artists are in the place where you're from and try to uplift them and support them. Wherever you live, you can try to dedicate yourself to learning the uncomfortable history of the people whose stories have been marginalized and to try to tell other people about them, right? Wherever you live, you can get together around a dinner table and say like let's read this book and talk about it together those are those are replicable interventions um, you know wherever you live you can start a freedom school you can start a bail fund two of the organizations I support the most in Chicago are the Chicago Community Bail Fund which uh, we raise money and give money uh, so that people who are in in jail because they can't afford bail so people who have not been convicted of any crime mm -hmm. and while they are incarcerated uh, risk losing their children, losing their jobs, losing their homes uh, to get those people out, right, so that they can await a fair trial because that's a system in our country that is only based on how much money you have, mm -hmm. right? That's something anybody can do anywhere. <clears throat> And the other group that I try to support a lot is Liberation Library, which is a, a group that um, provides books for young people that are incarcerated. Um, because I believe that young people that are living in jails, in prisons in this country, number one, should not be there. But if they are there, they at least have the right to books. Mm -hmm. That's a thing that anybody, those are like simple yes. things, yes. Right? right? So I name those two things um, just to say that like part of what I'm talking about when I'm talking about Chicago is like, insert your home here, yeah. right? And I think that all of us can learn to, to love our homes a little bit, a little bit better. Um, and also part of loving, part of, as James Baldwin says, like part of loving something is critiquing it, right? And yeah. so I think we can do that anywhere and everywhere. Right on. All Chicago right. is great, you should all come. <laughs> right on. <laughs> all right, well, I think we're out of time. Thank you, So I wanna thank, thank you, you so much, thank Eve, you it was so, so much. wonderful, yes. You're so great. And thank you all.